Okay, well today is Tuesday, June 28th, 2022, and um, I'm running very low on my bottle of uh, Bio Green Clean 7 to 1 mix um, that I usually use to clean pretty much everything in my home. Um, kitchen sink, um, sometimes the bathtub, um, dishes, pots and pans, and unless if I'm cooking a turkey I'm more likely to use a full strength bottle of Bio Green Clean as opposed to a 7 to 1 mix. Um, but because I, I knew that I was running low on it, I went out and, or I didn't go out, I, I ordered a, a new box. So later in this video, I'm going to be opening up, deboxing a um, new gallon of Bio Green, Bio Green Clean Concentrate, um, which probably has a brand new sprayer bottle in it too. Um, but before I before I debox this, I, I'd like to take some time and explain the backstory of why I choose to use Bio Green Clean, why I chose it initially, and why I continue to use it. So this backstory has a backstory to it. Um, the backstory on why I use the Bio Green Clean is because it, it was advertised on the Ed Schultz show about a decade ago when I first heard progressive radio station WCPT play Tom Hartman um, on his radio show. I found someone who, who seemed to understand the frustration and the pain that I was feeling. Um, prior to finding Tom Hartman on WCPT, what I would find on talk radio was generally right-wing people like Rush Limbaugh, and it would infuriate me. And you might be wondering, well, how can a talk radio host just infuriate you? And it's it's because we 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 saw things from such a different point of view. Um, so the backstory on this backstory, I'm going to take you back to when I was in college, um, learning to be an automotive mechanic. Um, even even that has a backstory. I went to a college preparatory high school. From there, my intention was to go on to biomedical engineering. I found that I was having trouble with calculus. I even had trouble with, with um, um, what was the with trigonometry. Trigonometry was the first math class that I really struggled in. Then I struggled even more in calculus. Um, and what I chose to do was learn automotive technology um, as kind of a break from my college, from my engineering curriculum. Um, I figured if I, if I, if I learned some hands-on get some hands-on experience with automotive technology. One, I can work on my own car. I don't have to put my trust into other people to work on my car. Um, I can do the repairs myself and the maintenance myself. Um, so I figured, okay, I'll, I'll take some time away from engineering curriculum. And um, I started out with one class in automotive and I found that I loved the automotive stuff and I dreaded going to the calculus. So I figured I'll, I'll go ahead and I'll get my two year degree in automotive. And I did that. Um, you can see here, this is all that I've got left of my certificate. I can't find any more, but you can see that I had passed um, in December on December 31st, 1987. It was issued to me that I had passed the ASC certification tests for um, engine repair, automotive or automatic transmission, transaxle, manual drive train, uh, 
drivetrain and axles, suspension and steering, brakes, electrical systems, heating and air conditioning, and engine performance. So I had passed all of the tests that were required to pass to qualify for um, master technician. And then from that point, I still needed geez, I still needed two years of um, um, working as an apprentice or something similar to apprentice work to qualify to be a journeyman technician and, and also to qualify to being a true um, master technician. But um, when I went when I went to my teacher, to tell him I had passed all my tests. One of my favorite teachers, um, he didn't seem as excited about it as I did. I, I told him I had passed all my tests and that I had gotten a job. That's what he was disappointed with. When I told him that I had gotten a job at a dealership, he immediately looked troubled. And that, I could not understand why he looked troubled. But he said, Frank, I, I have some connections with the people at Amico. At that time, BP was called Amico. Um, he said, I have some connections with, if, can I write you, I think you would do really well at Amico. Can I write for you a reference letter? Um, because there's a research team real close to where um, I went to school for, for college for automotive technician. Um, and I couldn't understand why he was disappointed that I had gotten a job at a dealership. Well, it took a couple of years for me to find out, for me to become disillusioned with what was going on at the dealership. He didn't even know which dealership I was at. Um, or I probably, no, no, at that time, I don't think he knew which dealership I was at. He just, when he found out that I was working at a dealership, he seemed troubled and wanted to get me out of that job um, or give me options out of that job. And I, I didn't, I, I was excited to have the new job that I had, so I, I went on and I worked at that new job. And I didn't pursue anything um, regarding getting a reference letter from him. Um, what I found out at, at the job, the apprenticeship went well, the semi-skilled went well. Um, I, I worked at one dealership as a as a apprentice for a year, and then I worked at another dealership as a semi-skilled. Maybe it was a year and a half at the first one. Maybe it was a year and a half. Maybe it was two years. Maybe it was one. It, it came out to three years. Um, I believe it came out to three years, two or three years. Anyhow, part of it was as an apprentice, part of it was as a semi-skilled, and um, then it became time to make the journeyman's money. And what I was told basically went like this. All right, you're going to be making the big bucks now, but let us tell you what you're going to be doing. You're going to be, on every day, you're going to sign about three of these, and four of these, and two of these. And I looked at it, and, and I thought, there's not enough time in the day for me, for anyone, but for me to accomplish all of this. And their, their reaction went something like, hey, we're not telling you you can't do the work. What we're telling you is you're going to sign for about three of these recalls and about four of these recalls and about two of these projects and, and so on. And what that, what that message sent to me, it strongly implied that they knew that there was not enough time in a work shift to accomplish all of those recalls. They knew for a fact that their intention was that I would sign for recall work that would never get done. That way they could still collect the money for the recall work that didn't get done. 
the customer brought the car in, it drove fine, the car drove out fine, the customer would never know that the recall work didn't get done. The dealership would get paid, I would know that the recall didn't get done, and if anything ever happened to those people who were driving that car, the management team would be able to point to me or any other mechanic who was doing the same kind of a thing. They would point to that mechanic and say, he didn't do the work, he signed for it, he's a liar. It all falls on him. Not us as management, it all falls on him. That was my disillusionment regarding dealerships. That was what I believe my teacher, I believe, was trying to spare me from ever experiencing by recommending or by offering that he would write a letter of recommendation for me to find a job at Amico. So there's where my disgust for right-wing media developed. Because in right-wing media, what you're going to find, or what I found when I would flip to it, was businesses are, are the greatest things on the face of the earth. They do nothing wrong. It's, it's the little guys, who, like the union members, who go on strike that are, that are there to destroy the business. And they, they don't appreciate what the big business has built for them. That's what, you're gonna he that's what I heard on right-wing media. And it would infuriate me because I knew that what the dealership wanted what the management of the dealership wanted was just to have someone they could blame when a family died on the highway. They would still collect the money, but they would have someone to blame when the family died on the highway. I hope that leg of this backstory makes sense to you, why I would get infuriated when I, when I would listen to right-wing media. So from there, as I'm flipping through the radio stations, sometimes going from song to song, and, and back then you would actually have to, I don't know that you could push a button. Mm. Somehow, yes, you could push a button back in the, in the 70s and 80s. Um, that was 83, so yeah, definitely by then you could push a button. Somehow, I happened upon WCPT, and I found Tom Hartman, a left-wing radio, a leftish, progressive radio talk show host who really understood what I was feeling about big companies and how they really don't care about, a lot of them really don't care about the customer. They care about the money. And if someone dies, they care about having someone they can blame for that death. Um, I didn't want to be that kind of person who... who I didn't want to have it hanging over my head that a family might die on the highway due to me trying to make more money by signing, signing, signing. So I left that dealership. Um, I had gotten a uh, real estate license. I had just by coincidence happened to have qualified for my real estate license at about the same time that I um, um, was being promoted to journeyman. Um, and I used that real estate license, the fact that I had just gotten that as my excuse to leave the automotive industry, um, because I, I would have felt like every, every, every time I was signing for something that didn't get done, I was becoming a felon over and over and over again, another felony after another felony after another felony. And I would not like that to be on my conscience, so I just left. Um, that's two years of education, automotive technology education, down the drain, because I didn't want to do what management was essentially forcing me to do, become a felon. So when I found Tom Hartman, who 
from his progressive left-wing stance and the people who would advertise on, on his shows, the lawyers were also professional left-wing, had a left-wing stance. Um, um, when I could hear people who really understood that it's important to do the work that you're being assigned and not just signing for it, that uh, just collecting the money is not the most important part of the job. Getting the work done is the most important part of the job. Collecting the money is secondary to that. I believe Tom Hartman and the progressives understand that concept. Um, so I, I enjoyed listening to Tom Hartman, and obviously as I'm listening to him on WCPT, there would be other people who would, other talk show hosts, you know, Tom can't be there 24-7. There would be other talk show hosts too. And another of the talk show hosts, his name was Ed Schultz. Ed Schultz would come on before Tom Hartman, and I think Stephanie Miller would come on in between them. But Ed Schultz had one advertiser who was almost always on his radio. Uh, on a daily basis, this one advertiser would religiously come on to his talk show, and that advertiser was Bio Green Clean. So that's where my affinity, my long standing affinity for Bio Green Clean has come from. Um, that, that was the seed of why I am so fond of Bio Green Clean, because they would financially support someone. Not Tom Hartman exactly. I, I don't think I ever heard Bio Green Clean run a commercial on Tom Hartman's show, but they would run it on Ed Schultz's show, and Ed Schultz and Tom Hartman had very similar views regarding the workplace. And I'm going to go ahead and restart my camera. Okay, so Bio Green Clean. To me, in their commercials, they made a lot of sense that, that, it's, that their product is natural, um, doesn't have any poisons in it. Um, um, I believe that was the general gist of the commercials. And Ed Schultz even went so far, not Ed Schultz, the owner of Bio Green Clean even went so far as to use it as a veggie wash. That's not recommended anymore. But um, at the time that I bought it, um, at the time that, that I introduced myself to it, um, so now for veggie wash, I, I use a different brand, um, and it doesn't have to be this brand, but just so you can see that I do buy something different to use as a veggie wash now. Um, but at that time, um, the owner of Bio Green Clean was so convinced of the safety of Bio Green Clean that he would actually, I, I think he might have even consumed some at one point in time, um, and not just used it as a veggie wash, um, but I've since had a conversation in one of my times of ordering I've had a conversation with her daughter and her with his daughter and his daughter was very vehement about not using bio green clean as a veggie wash so in that conversation she scared me away from from doing what if i remember correctly her dad had touted as one of the uses of bio green clean was to use it as a veggie wash um, that conversation with her kind of steered me away from, from using it on veggies and, and fruits and things like that. But um, I'm getting sidetracked here. Back to... Okay, so I, I was introduced to Bio Green Clean because I found a community of people who thought the way that I thought about big business. That a lot of them are run by shady characters who care more about the money than they do about the actual work getting done properly. Um, this community of people had one advertiser who seemed to really believe in them, or at least one of their one of the community members 
Ed Schultz had an advertiser who liked to advertise on his radio station. So I gave it a try and it worked well for me. Um, um, so I've been using it now for over a decade. Um, over 10 years I've been using Bio Green Clean. And, um, oh, oh. So you can tell that I, I've grown disgusted with some American business management. Um, and, that, and that disgust is, is very real. Um, what I found when I went away to college to learn business administration was that there are a, a good group of well-educated teachers who also understand that a good chunk of American business is run poorly by its management. Um, but one thing that I came and one thing that I came across on the radio, probably WCPT again, that same radio station. There was a someone was interviewing Carol Fowler of the Chicago Sun Times. Um, Carol Fowler summed up. In, in a maxim, what I feel is the solution to um, the frustration that I've had regarding American business managers um, choosing profits over actually getting the work done. And, and The sentence that she said, the statement that she made, I believe it went like this, the public will reward firms who, and if, if this is all you remember about this sentence, I think this is, this is the most important part, hire professionals and let them do their job. I'm going to repeat that. Hire professionals and let them do their job manager after manager after manager that I've come across has failed to understand that you need to hire professionals and let them do their job. That means giving them enough time to do what needs to be done. If you, if you say, okay, go ahead and do it, but you only have this much time to get it done, and that time that you give them is not enough time to get it done, you haven't let them do their job. Okay? So, if I were to tweak Carol Fowler's statement, the, the, the tweak that I would make to it would be hire professionals and let or enable them to do their job. Um, and the word enable them, the word enable would include within it, give them enough time. Make sure that they have enough time. Fight the powers that be that are above you. As a manager, fight the, man, the people who are putting their time restraints on you. Let them know, the people who are above you, who are telling you that these guys need to cut down on the time that they take per job, let them know that's mismanagement. That's not a good thing to do. When you hire a professional and enable them to to work, they're going to remain motivated. Anyhow, I'm getting way off, way off subject here, but um, I wanted to throw that in here since I've already gone into why I left the automotive industry, basically flushed down the toilet two years of um, 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 college education. Um, because I was so disgusted by what I saw in the dealership. And the fact that my teacher didn't even know which dealership I would encounter this at, because I left the one dealership that I had started at, and later went on to the second dealership where I saw this happen. But the level of concern that I saw in my teacher, who knew that I was going into a dealership, and his immediate response was to, Frank, can I give you a recommendation, a letter of recommendation, so that you can apply at Amico instead? 
You'll have that option available to you. Can I give you the letter of recommendation? And I turned it down because I was excited to have a new job. Um, what that tells me is that that teacher knew that what I was going to face at the dealership, any dealership, the vast majority of dealerships out there, I was going to face that kind of mismanagement. And I've seen that kind of mismanagement over and over and over again, not just in, not just in the, the dealership um, environment, but in restaurant environments where people don't have where people are under where the understaffing happens it happens in retail understaffing happens everywhere Sometimes it's violent. Sometimes management has options other than understaffing, and they choose to understaff anyhow. Um, it's sick. It's, it's absolutely sick. So the, the way to fix that, I'm going to throw that out here one more time. The way to fix the understaffing is to understand that the public will reward firms who hire professionals and let slash enable them to do their job. Okay? Um, so that, that was a, a very long backstory on a backstory of why I like bio why I was introduced to Bio Green Clean. Now, the backstory on why I continue to use Bio Green Clean, because to the best of my knowledge, BioGreenClean has stopped advertising on WCPT. I might be wrong. They might still be advertising there, but I haven't heard a commercial from them in a long time. Um, but I continue to use BioGreenClean as my primary cleaner because it cleans. It doesn't kill. It cleans. Um, and without going into how superbugs evolve and make diseases even worse, I'm just going to say that cleaning things with Bio Green Clean has worked very well for me, while a lot of people who use products that kill bacteria and kill viruses, instead of just cleaning the debris that they leave behind, um, I would say that my, that my history of health fares very well against the history of health of people who use um, disinfectants and, and things that kill. So um, what I'm getting at is very few people have a, a strong knowledge of microbiology. I certainly don't have a strong knowledge of microbiology, but I'll, I'll say that if you if you put my if you compare hmm, my history of health suggests that the way that I treat the microbiome in my kitchen um, the fact that I haven't gotten sick and needed to call into work I haven't gotten so sick that I need to call into work and say that I need the day off in I believe it's been several years. Um, suggests that I'm doing something right by cleaning as opposed to killing the things that are on my kitchen counters and in my sink and 
uh, even though I work with raw eggs and I cook meats um, and fish, um, the cleaning, regular, good, thorough cleaning seems to work very well and compare very well with those who use the more typical annihilate everything 99.9% .9 of everything it comes in contact with uh, methodology. So um, um, I'm going to continue to use the BioGreen Clean. That's my plan. And if you'd like to see how I mix it, uh, today's a good day because um, my kitchen is a mess. You can see that I've got plenty of things to clean. But I'm running out of the BioGreen Clean in that bottle. And I happen to have my new box, so let's go ahead and open up that box. Um, we'll do that right here. Usually I would clean off my plate here and use that to hold my um, sprayer assembly um, because it usually I would clean it and use it that way. I think today I'm just gonna take just gonna take a clean plate, set the clean plate down. That's where my sprayer is gonna sit. Okay, so I've got my box here. Let's go ahead and open up our gallon of BioGreen Clean Concentrate. My knife is in this drawer over here, and the tripod is in the way of that knife. Let's just move the tripod. Hopefully we'll have better luck now. Okay, and the phone is ringing. I'm going to pause the camera. Okay, back to the deboxing. So, in here we've got the new sprayer bottle. Let's see if I can do this without making the peanuts fall all over the place. Brand new sprayer bottle. Now, I did once receive a sprayer bottle that failed. Um, but when you order a gallon of the concentrate, I don't think that's a gallon of the bottle. I think they sent me a quart. Anyhow, when you order the gallon bottle of concentrate, um, they send you a, a, f a f free 32 ounce sprayer bottle. But like I said, one of them has failed me in the past, so I want to test that. Also, this bottle over here, which I've been using for years, um, has probably been in use for about six years. So what I'll probably do is start fresh with that bottle and once this bottle is completely empty um, I'll clean it and dry it and that way I'll have a, a, a truly clean uh, second bottle or fourth bottle. Um, anyhow, let's pull this out. And it comes with this handy dandy book that tells you all about um, what mixtures to go with. And I've consistently gone with the 7 to 1 mixture. That's one part of BioGreen Clean Concentrate to seven parts of water. Um, for me, that's generally been a really good mix. 
with everything except for turkey like around Thanksgiving when I cook a turkey and then I'll I'll use a full strength um, I won't mix it at all I'll just put full strength into one of my extra bottles and spray that down on my uh, um, cookware that has the turkey grease in it because turkey grease seems to be extremely difficult to remove um, So I've probably got about four of these books now, which means over the course of about 10 years, I've, I've ordered, maybe it's more like 12 years, I've ordered BioGreen Clean, I think a total of about four or five times. Now the bottle of concentrate's about $90. I don't know that this is going to be a whole gallon. Somehow the box looks smaller than I would think a gallon would fit into. Yes, that is a whole gallon of BioGreen Clean Concentrate. So, like I said, I've got my clean plate sitting here. Clean plate sitting there. I'm going to take out my sprayer and set it so that my sprayer wand isn't touching anything. That'll keep the sprayer wand clean. And I've got this handy dandy little funnel that holds what, maybe two or three ounces. Okay, and I'm going to keep a finger underneath that. Ideally, I should have washed my hands, but you know what? I'm going to wash my hands. I'd rather not contaminate the whole um, So now my hands are about as clean as they'll ever be. Which means the amount of germs that are going into my new BioGreen Clean bottle are going to be about as few as they'll ever be. So I'm going to put my finger underneath the uh, bottom of this and fill with water cold water. Cold water tends to have fewer germs than does warm water. Warm water cleans better, but cold water has fewer germs. So that's why I'm using cold water. 
Okay, so into my new sprayer bottle, I'm going to put in... I just did that wrong. Okay, let's go back over to the sink. Empty out the funnel. Put in one funnel's worth of Bio Green Clean Concentrate. And then we'll add seven funnels of water, cold water. Now I did the Bio Green Clean before the water because any of the Bio Green Clean concentrate that was stuck to the sides of the funnel will get rinsed into the sprayer bottle. That's two. That's three. Four. Five. Six. seven. Seven funnels of water to the one funnel full of um, Bio Green Clean. Gives a mix, a seven to one mix. Now the bottle is only about two-thirds or three-quarters of the way filled, but that's okay. The concentration is right where I want it to be. Go ahead and mix that together. Go ahead and put my clean plate back by the clean plate. Make sure that this little guy is set So that's off right there. I don't know, I doubt you can read it, but I'll go ahead and turn it so that it's on. Nope, now it's on stream. I don't like stream. That's definitely off. This should be spray. There we go. So now it's turned to spray. And we'll go ahead and test it and see if it works. Oh yeah, like a charm. Okay, so now that we know that we have a good bottle with a good sprayer, um, I'll go ahead and write 7 to 1. And this other bottle over here, which is used to say full strength, I'll go ahead and rewrite. And that'll be for like cleaning turkey grease. I don't think it has anything in it right now. And then this older bottle of 7 to 1, when I use it all up, um, I'll rinse out the bottle and let it dry, 
somewhere so that in the future if I need another bottle and sprayer uh, another bottle and sprayer because one of them might wear out um, I'll have the extra bottle and the extra sprayer so that's it that's how I mix my bio green clean and um, now you know the backstory also of why why I chose bio green clean and um, the reason that I continue to use it is because it tends to clean my surfaces without <clears throat> so all around us are micro microorganisms and research has found I, I don't have the research to cite right here but research has found that the vast majority of microorganisms don't tend to be pathogenic yes there are some pathogenic microorganisms in the world um, the coronavirus is a pathog pathogenic organism. Um, e. coli is a pathogenic pathogenic organism. Salmonella is a pathogenic organism. But among those pathogenic organisms, there's also thousands and millions and billions of other organisms that are not pathogenic. And the ones that are not pathogenic fight to survive amongst the ones that are pathogenic. And um, if, you, if you kill off all of the organisms, or the vast majority of the organisms, like you by using a product that says it kills 99.9% .9 of, of microorganisms that it comes into contact with, well that 0.1% that still remains is a can be a really nasty thing and right now I can pretty much assure you that my countertops are not likely to be populated by just that 0.1% of nasties right now my countertops are probably pretty much um, populated by mostly the vast majority of what's on there is friendly helpful microorganisms and amongst those very that very heavy densely populated friendly group of micro microorganisms there's a few pathogens but they're all fighting each other and I'd rather have a whole lot of random things fighting a few path pathogens than having a countertop that's full of just one very hard to kill type of pathogen. I hope that makes sense. I know it makes sense to me. I hope it makes sense to you too. That's it. Bye.